Numbers 27 and 28. We have two short stories in these chapters, and then in chapter 28 we have um, a reiteration of the sacrificial laws. Uh, we're going to keep going with chapter 28 next week, but today we're going to focus on the two short stories we have. So the first one is about Zelo Fahad's daughters, and well, that's how I think you say his name. <laughs> and the other one is about Joshua and Moses. So let's have a look at the first one first. Uh, Zelo Fahad's daughters. There are five sisters uh, whose parents have died off in the wilderness as a part of the first generation. And they, these sisters, they come to Moses inside of all the elders and the priests and they have a request for, for them. They know that according to the law that's been outlined so far in Numbers, when they are to enter the land, these daughters won't inherit any land because they don't have any brothers. And it was only the sons who were set up to inherit land. And so they come with the request that they be given land. Give us property among our father's relatives, they say. And so Moses takes this request of theirs to God. And God says in verse 7, What uh, these daughters are saying is right. You must certainly give them property as inheritance among their father's relatives and give their father's inheritance to them. Which is a good outcome, I reckon. Uh, God recognizes that this is a gap in the law that he has outlined so far. And so God honors their request and he insists that this actually be treated as precedent if any other similar uh, situation arises in Israel. What the daughters do in this story is very interesting because they hear the law and they recognize that there is an apparent injustice in what they hear. Uh, their family isn't going to inherit land simply because their father hasn't had any sons. Uh, just reminding you that that's not his fault. He didn't do anything wrong. Uh, he just didn't have any sons. He didn't get to choose which um, sperm penetrated the egg. You know, that's just a biological fact. Um, and so what these daughters do is they appeal to God's broader character as a God of justice for their land. And God grants their appeal. Now, think about the Garden of Eden story for a moment, because I think this is super helpful. When God made humans and he put them in the garden, he made two kinds of humans. Remember, he made male and female together. And their job together was to work the land and to subdue it and to um, have authority over it. They were both equally uh, meant to do those two ro those roles. And so, in this story, as Israel enter into the promised land, which is often referred to as the New Eden, um, these daughters are appealing for the land to be for the Adams, as well as being for the Eves, and not just for the Adams. Because that is how God originally intended his creation. Um, so these women are appealing on that basis, and, and God grants their request We'll come back to that story a little bit later because it gives us a really helpful model for how we should um, consider issues that arise, uh, new issues that arise for us that the Bible doesn't speak to specifically. We have another story following that. Um, and this is a brief story about Joshua replacing Moses. So God tells Moses that he should go up Mount Nebo, which is in the... Um, Abraham Ranges, uh, modern day Jordan, uh, on the border of Israel, uh, where he will be able to see the Jordan River down in the valley below, and then across the Jordan River, he'll be able to see the promised land. And after going there and seeing the promised land, uh, he will die, we're told. Just like Aaron already has, because both Aaron and Moses failed to honor God as holy before the eyes of the people. We read about this earlier in Numbers. Uh, it's a sad episode, but Moses will not enter the promised land. And so verse 15, Moses says to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out, before, to go out and to come in before them so that the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Now, Joshua seems like the obvious choice as a replacement for Moses. Um, we've read a, quite a bit about Joshua so far, even if you don't remember it. Joshua was with Moses when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to collect the law. And Joshua was one of the spies who has already been into the promised land and has seen it. 
Uh, and actually, Joshua demonstrated his trust in God because he and Caleb were convinced that God could help them take the land, even though the people didn't listen to them. So Joshua seems like the obvious choice. But at the same time, Joshua is vastly different from Moses. Firstly, Moses is a Levite, and as a Levite, he's able to enter into the tabernacle. Joshua is from the tribe of Ephraim, and he cannot go into the tabernacle. Uh, Moses is called friends with God. Uh, in Numbers 12, it told us that Moses saw God face to face uh, and spoke to him as friends. But Joshua, he must inquire of the Lord through the priests. This is what it says in verse 21. He is to stand before Eliezer the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. Now, the Urim was um, was a part of the ephod uh, that the priests wore, and it was um, yeah a way of discerning decisions from God. Probably had something to do with casting lots. We don't know a whole lot about it. We'll talk about it later. We talked about it back in Leviticus a little bit. Uh, but basically what this means is that um, even though Joshua is the obvious choice to replace Moses, he is still a vastly different leader and he will have a vastly different kind of leadership to what Moses has had already in Israel. Moses has been a unique person in redemptive history um, and I'd say that no one else has had or experienced the kind of relationship with God that Moses experienced at this point. Now all of that is to say that I think there is probably something worth pondering in all of this about leadership succession in general. Because Joshua is the obvious choice, and yet Joshua is vastly different. Okay, let's wrap this all up. This episode with uh, these daughters, it's a reminder to us of how we can use the Bible when we encounter an issue that the Bible doesn't speak to directly. Now, we don't have Moses to go to and speak to Yahweh on our behalf. And so um, sometimes this can be difficult, but this is... Helpful to remember that as followers of Jesus, we have someone who is better than Moses. We have the Holy Spirit who dwells among us. And while we can't see the Spirit physically, uh, followers of Jesus under the guidance of the Spirit, um, we have opportunity to exercise wisdom and critical thinking rather than just following a rule given by Moses. We actually see an example of this kind of decision making playing out in Acts chapter 15. Uh, remember Acts chapter 15, the first disciples are discussing what laws need to be followed by non-Israelite converts to Christianity. Um, they follow this same pattern. Um, they discuss, they pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and they turn to the scripture for insight. And then through Christian history, important theological debates have been settled by groups of believers from different schools of thought, hashing things out, praying, reading scripture, and coming to agreement. Now, this doesn't always happen. Uh, it, doesn't, it, never, it never happens perfectly. But this is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to follow this model. Now, just like in Acts chapter 15, the Spirit doesn't reveal new information to followers of Jesus. That's not to say that the Spirit doesn't still speak and work among God's people. But rather, the, Spirit, the Spirit's revelation is always consistent with God's previous revelation in Scripture. Now, you notice in Acts chapter 15 that they, they turn to the prophecy in Amos chapter 9 that Gentiles will be included into God's family. And that's how they make sense of what's happening among them. Now, as followers of Jesus, we, we seek the Spirit's wisdom in current theological debates. And the Spirit shows us how to apply what is already in the Bible. So we should pray for God's insight. Uh, we should pray for the Spirit's guidance on issues that are new. Every generation has to learn to do this because every generation raises new questions about the things, about how we should live as Christians in the world. So let's follow the example that we have here in Numbers and in Acts. Let's pray for that kind of guidance and for us as a church and for the church that we belong to. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would lead us into truth, that you would guide us by your Spirit that you would keep us in step with the Spirit and in step with the Scriptures. And Lord, I ask that the Spirit would illuminate for us um, how we should understand the Bible. 
so that we can walk according to your ways in the world. Amen.